well before I was of working age, I would do anything and everything to, to just make money on my own. I would uh, dye Nike Elite socks and flip them on eBay. I started a lawn care business and cut grass with my friend and would go door to door for fun to every door in the neighborhood just to try to close deals and get people to buy our lawn care service. I had We had a landscaper who wasn't very good at lead generation and at whatever it was, 11 years old, I offered to go generate him leads. So I would go door to door on all the neighborhoods by us and start to generate him leads. And if I'm not mistaken, I think you got a call and actually said I started overwhelming him with the amount of leads. <laughs> yeah, <he got> <laughs> Umberto texted me and says, please have your son stop sending me leads. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> right. So, but it, 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 there was always that doing something on my own, but it always had that sales undertone. Like I used to love going to every kid, whenever you got that, like you have to sell chocolate fundraiser, hated it. And I was like, oh, this is going to be a piece of cake. Yeah. Like I looked at it as an opportunity. I was going to be the top person in the class to do it because I got to go door to the entire neighborhood, knock on every door, making sure I sold all the chocolate. Like, I used to love that kind of stuff, but most people despise it. <laughs> I remember when you, how much did you sell that $100 bill for? $120. Yes, I did flip a $100 bill on eBay for $120. <laughs> Hey, everybody. Welcome to today's episode of the Your Practice Mastered podcast. My name is Richard James, and today I'm joined with a very special guest, MPS. Hey, everyone. Super excited to be on. feel like you haven't ever heard my voice before, but I'm excited about today because I think I get the opportunity to be interviewed, similar to Rich last time. So this is going to be a fun episode. At least we're certainly going to try to make it so and hopefully draw some valuable lessons while doing it. Yeah, yeah. So obviously, if you've been listening to this at all, you know that uh, MPS is my son, right? So his name is Michael Patrick Strauk, and and my name is Richard James, and my real name is Richard James Strauk, but nobody could say or spell Strauk as I had all my companies, and so I decided when I built this company, I was going to brand under Richard James, and but Michael doesn't feel that way, and he that's he goes by MPS. I suppose that's why he did that, but I'll let him tell you that. What I wanted, you know, our goal today, Michael. Correct me if I'm wrong, but was for them to get to know you a little bit better because last week they got to know me a little bit better, right? Yeah, that's the goal. I want to share a little bit more context behind the story and what, what led me to be in this position right now. So tell me, what was the reason for the MPS? Did that come out of previous YouTube years or did that, like what, how did that develop? Was it also because the difficulty to say and spell our name or what, what's up? No, it was actually Delaney, my fiance, future bride. Her mom originally started saying MPS, calling me MPS. And then I was like, not like that. And, yeah. and then I started using that in YouTube content. And then I started using that around you guys. And then everybody started calling me that. So MPS just stuck. And it coincidentally just fits a little bit more naturally because Strauk is a little difficult to pronounce for someone that doesn't know it. So yes. MPS was a nice fit. Yeah, I had somebody that's known us for a long time the other day say Strouch to me for like yeah. the hundredth time. And I finally said, look, we're friends. So I just need to tell you, I don't care. You could call me whatever you want, but I think you want to know that's not the right way to say our name. And they were like mortified, right? That they've been saying it wrong all these years. But I was like, it's been too long for me not to tell you, right? So like, I always thought it was Strouch. I'm like, I know you've, we get it. But here's what it really is. So I don't think they'll ever yeah. forget it again. Probably but not. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, let's, you know, so look, we both work kneecap to kneecap with attorneys on a daily basis. The goal yep. of our, the mission of this podcast, as you well know, is to provide value to those attorneys. And I think them getting to know who you are and why you have the chops that you have to teach them, I think is really important. But before yep. I go there, I don't know, maybe tell everybody something that everybody else doesn't know about you. I'm a registered ACL player. So I'm a registered American <laughs> Cornhole League player. So I'm welcoming a challenge from anybody that's listening to this podcast. I'd be willing to probably put money on the fact that I'll win. Now I'm putting my mouth on the line there, but uh, yeah, that, that's my fun fact. Unfortunately, during COVID, there was no matches to actually play, but I did get registered during that time period. Oh, that's great. Well, 
So yeah, so I get the my myself and my best friend growing up, or one of my best friends growing up, Brian Wallace. He we get the credit for turning Michael and his co partner Corey into <laughs> cornhole maniacs, and Michael has now become. Very good at cornhole after many years, and he still claims that they have the winning record. I suppose I've got to. We do. Up. It's there's it. We're, <laughs> we're three and zero over the last three years on the beach. So, I mean, it, it's a winning record. <laughs> uh, you would think that I, you know, you would think after he got to the legal age and he could drink beer with us on the beach that we would definitely beat him, but that didn't happen. So the uh, anyway, yeah. okay. So so you, okay. So you've thrown down the cornhole gauntlet. Good. So you're going to be getting messages for uh, $100 cornhole matches soon. Comment Here. down below. I'm uh, willing to take all of them. Uh, uh, <laughs> all right. So look, a lot of times I like to start this entrepreneurial journey at the beginning, but I actually want to reverse roles a little bit. I'm going to build the story behind, you know, sure. really your uh, origin story into yeah. the legal arena, because I think that's really sure. important. So Agreed. walk us through, like, you know, you, how did you, well, really what I'm looking for is a lesson, but I'm going to let you tell the story and then I'll ask the lesson point. Yeah. How did you find your way into the legal arena and helping people understand how to close deals in the console room? Yeah. So I'll start at the middle of the story then. So if I start at the okay. middle of the story, the way that transition happened was I had graduated from college. And I had just gotten done with a business that I had built over really a six year period. And I decided I wanted to exit out of that business and just graduating. I felt like there was opportunity in front of me. I could really do whatever I wanted. Thankfully, that business, which I'm sure we'll touch on, provided me a very good income source throughout my end of high school years and all of college years. And so I had come to you and I said, hey, let's do something together because I thought that would be a pretty cool opportunity. And as you recall, we sat down in Christmas time and went through just about every single business option you could think of. We put out strengths, weaknesses, what we liked, what we didn't like, and ran through the gamut of just about every business you could imagine. And we finally boiled it down and we were like, okay, what's up that we're both really good at sales, right? Nope. Sales was just not... Uh -huh. Before you go there, I get we're, we're about to run into this, and I I'm excited about that, but I'm going to have questions there, and I have a question yeah. that hit me just now before, so forgive okay. me for interrupting you. That's but okay. the lesson I want to take, I, the, what you just said, I really want to pull a lesson out of. So mm -hmm. you decided to exit a business, right? Yeah. And you, the way that you exited the business, I mean, so what did that mean for you? Did you sell the business? Good question. No, not yet. <laughs> I haven't. I, so, so I. So, I so you business. decided to let the business run. I decided to let the business run. I, I, I built a business that generated mostly passive income for the most part, and I decided I would let it run with maybe a little maintenance here and there, and just let the income that came come over the the next few years. That's really the way I decided to exit it. Uh, I really didn't have a clear exit strategy to be honest with you well it's not I like it's, I, well i don't i it's not like it's i'm not that wasn't blame it was more like so yeah. but the point i want to get to is here's the lesson in this i think you decide to let it run and for a while it ran just fine and brought you in income but over time the more attention you put on something else and the less attention you put on this something happened to that business didn't it oh absolutely i mean we boil it down to one word that one word being focus my focus was on something else. My focus and effort were on something else. And so there was no focus or attention happening on that other business. And I had already come to terms with the fact that if at some point in time, the income from that wound down, I was okay with that. And I had to be okay with that because I wasn't doing anything to help facilitate it to grow. So focus was the lesson. What you put your focus on is what's going to grow or what you're going to attempt to grow. And so because there was no focus on that business over time, it, it's not completely gone, but it certainly came down quite substantially from where it was at a high point. Yeah, good. Okay, great. That was what I want to get. So back to the, you chose sales and sales training is what you were passionate about and you can pick yeah. back up where you were. Yeah. So that, I mean, that when we sat down, we looked at it, we said sales, I, I, in my previous business, which I will loop back to and touch on, I was doing training. 
And so I, I was training through video content. And so training was something I was already familiar with doing. Sales was something I've always loved to do. And I've done it throughout my entire life. It's been an undertone of just about everything I've always done. So sales training seemed like a natural fit. Well, obviously, you know, working with Partners Club, you had a group of law firm owners and you recognized that law firm owners could use help with sales. And so we decided to launch into law firm owners. So what we decided to do was I was going to go work in a firm and solve the sales process, right? Mm -hmm. I was going to go physically do it. Yeah. And so that's what I did. We had a firm step up, raise their hand. I know we referenced it in their podcast episode, but the Grafton's out in Maryland decided they would give me the opportunity to come in and prove this out. So we took the intellectual property from Partners Club. I boiled down this very convoluted sales system into our current sales system, came into the Grafton's firm and they were closing at 50% at the time. And this was during COVID era. So we were running virtual consultations and by the end of the 90 days that they gave me, I, we were closing at 84%. We increased their fees, increased the amount of paid in fulls that happened during the initial consultation. It was a smashing success. The Graftons loved it. And I decided to then launch into a beta group of clients of different law firm owners in different practice areas so, because so I had I got, to figure. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. So, so that's a pretty dramatic increase. And I'm going to come back to that word focus. Do you believe the your ability to focus on solving that one problem and uh, knowing how to solve the problem using the system that you had, is that what made the difference? Or is it was it just you and you're so good at sales, you've been selling your whole life, and that's why you're able to get that result? No, I mean, obviously having an undertone of sales helped with the initial launch of this but focus is what did it. I mean, because I wasn't focused on running every aspect of their business. I was focused on solving, converting more consultations into paying clients. One very specific thing. And so that focus helped guided that increase in conversion rate. And more so to further that point, we took that focus and I decided I had to make sure it wasn't just me. So mm. I had to now take that same system and figure out if I could teach other law firms to implement it. So I took a beta group, different law firm owners, different practice areas, and I started training them on this system and structure. And they came with an average across all of them of about a 33.7% close rate. That's what and they at the were closing of, at. That's what they were closing that's at. That's what they were closing at. When they okay. originally started, right? When they originally started 33.7%. And at the end of 30 days of implementing this structure and system, they all averaged out at about 65%. So, so they jumped from 33.7 to 65%. Well, then the thesis proved true. We determined that we can take this same system, take me out of the equation and teach law firms to do this. And that's exactly what we did. And then we took it and grew it and grew it. And now, you know, we've had the opportunity through the closing room across all facets of its impact over 100 firms. How many consults do you think you have either personally participated in, listened to, or coached clients or client salespeople or your own salespeople for a minute when you had some done for you stuff? How many do you think you've been through personally through the years now? By easily thousands. I, I mean, I would say at this point, I'm close to 5,000 consultations. Right. I probably either I've run, listened to, or helped coach on or score. So it's been a lot. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so the question of expert is not in question anymore. How, how old are you, by the way? 25. You're 20 and years the, the, old and you've done 5,000 consultations or coach done 5,000 consultations. Oh my goodness. Can you imagine when you're 50? Okay. So you no, know, yeah, well, you're, you're looking at them. So I guess this is, if you're lucky, you'll have hair. You probably will have hair. I won't. Uh, you you got your so. grandfather's genes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I hope so too, for your sake. So, okay. So let, now let's go back. So let's go back. Let's yep. go back into the history a little bit and yep. let's talk a little bit about, so we set the st status of this, but w one of the things that I thought was really interesting. So not a lot of lawyers, interesting enough, here's what I find. Not a lot of lawyers actually chose to open their own practice. Like they obviously chose to open their own practice. That's why they did it. But they didn't like go into law thinking that. And I know that because I, I taught at a, I taught, I 
sat in on one class and was a teacher or a, a lecturer for a class. And I asked a bunch of law students, how many of them like are consider themselves entrepreneurial business owners, whatever, and not mm -hmm. a single hand went up. And yeah. there was like 20 or 30 students in the room. But then I said, well, how many of you think at some point in your career, you may have to open up, you know, hang your own shingle? Everybody's hand went up, right? So what's interesting is they don't see themselves as business owners, but you've always seen yourself that way. I mean, maybe it's because mom and I always, you know, believed that profits were better than wages, but I also say that you were born this way. So you always saw yourself as a business owner first. Is that right? Yeah, I call it genetic wiring plus nurture versus nature, but I, I never even saw another path. Like I it, mentally, I didn't even comprehend the idea of working for somebody, like being an employee. It just never even crossed my mind. What did you have? You had job. You had a job. Yeah, had I, had jobs, right? <laughs> I had several. I had several. I was a dishwasher. I was a busser. I was a server. I flipped pizzas. I worked at a Christmas tree shop, being a salesperson. I did a lot of jobs but they were all very quick and temporary and I was never able to stick at them very long. Ah, yeah. So, so, but all, it's interesting. All of some of those jobs, the ones you liked, I think had more salesmen, like the server job. You enjoyed it because it had the, the server. And my favorite was probably the Christmas tree sales job. That was oh, the, right. the most. Yeah. That's right, right. One. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yep. That, okay, that so, was the most. So, but your, so your one. journey, you had jobs, but along the way, you also started businesses along the way. So you had this spirit, right. Of, yeah. of, generating a business here or there, correct? Well, before I was of working age, I would do anything and everything to, to just make money on my own. I would uh, dye Nike Elite socks and flip them on eBay. I, would, I started a lawn care business and cut grass with my friend and would go door to door for fun to every door in the neighborhood just to try to close deals and get people to buy our lawn care service. I had We had a landscaper who wasn't very good at lead generation and at whatever it was 11 years old i offered to go generate him leads so i would go door to door on all the neighborhoods by us and start to generate him leads and if i'm not mistaken i think you got a call and actually said i started overwhelming him with the amount of leads he got so <laughs> yeah humberto texted me he says please have your son stop sending me leads <laughs> yeah <laughs> right so it, but it, it, there was always that doing something on my own, but it always had that sales undertone. Like I used to love going to every kid, whenever you got that, like you have to sell chocolate fundraiser, hated it. And I was like, oh, this is going to be a piece of cake. Like I would just, I looked at it as an opportunity. I was going to be the top person in the class to do it because I got to go door to the entire neighborhood, knock on every door, making sure I sold all the chocolate. Like I used to love that kind of stuff, but most people despise it. <laughs> I remember when you, how much did you sell that $100 bill for? $120. Yes, I did flip a $100 bill on eBay for $120. Yes. <laughs> so, okay. Everybody's going, because I might put that at the headlines. He's so good at sales, he could sell a $100 bill for $120. How did you yeah. sell a $100 bill for $120? I heard somewhere that there was a new $100 bill that came out and I decided to go get it one of the right. new $100 bills. Like it's like, 2011 or 12 or something like that, right? Somewhere in that ballpark. And, and so I, I decided to, to go to the bank and get a new hunt. I didn't think it looked all that special, but someone obviously thought it did. And so I put it on eBay for $120 and somebody bought it. I, moral <laughs> of the story, it was great to sell it for $120. It really wasn't ultimately worth it outside of the story because it was a real pain to have to package up how they wanted it. It had to be like collector mint edition. Nothing could get touched, folded, anything like that. So I think I spent more money in packaging it than it was actually even worth to me. But the story is <laughs> That's great. Good. All right. So, so you obviously, you were active in generating profits better than wages, took some jobs to figure some things out. But whilst you were doing that, you did land on, like you actually had started, if I'm not mistaken, would you call it the computer MD of Gilbert? Am I right about that? Yeah, I started running. It started by doing uh, local like computer lessons because I like technology for senior citizens in the area. And I called it Computer for MD and Gilbert. Citizens. We were back in Gilbert. Right. 
And, and so then I figured, okay, if I could do it there, maybe I'll try to start doing like technology tutorials online. So I started a YouTube channel, the computer MD at Gilbert. And then what had happened, and this is where we launched into the business that fed me all the way through college is I got 50 subscribers on YouTube with computer MD at Gilbert. And I wanted to build a website to try to find ways, of course, to optimize revenue and start getting people off of YouTube onto my own list. And what I did was, I was looking for all the web development platforms, finally landed on Wix. Wix was one that I really liked, thought it was a cool platform. And when I was trying to build the website, I recognized that I couldn't find training resources. Like it was Wix was brand new and I couldn't find anything. Like I tried to do something when I built the website, couldn't find how to do it. So then I decided, I don't know, light bulb just went off. Well, I've already got a YouTube channel. I like technology and there's obviously an open market here. So I just started making Wix tutorials and I started showing people, I would tinker and then I would show people how to do what I did. And so I just started doing that and then it started to grow and then it grew and then it continued to grow and Wix was growing in popularity alongside it, which of course was an added benefit to all of this. And I grew it to the point where I became Wix's largest global influencer. And I was the primary source on YouTube for Wix training content. And I was able to generate leads at ease, like on demand. I didn't have to do anything. Leads would just come to me and say, hey, can you help build a website? And so while that was happening, I decided to build a web development agency off the back of it. And I had zero acquisition costs because the leads would just flow in. And I looked at that as another opportunity to get to optimize sales because I get to generate these leads and now sell them. And so I built this web development agency. It was going really great until it didn't. And I hit a point where during college, because this was all during college that I built this, it got to the point where I had probably about nine people on the team and it got stressful fast. There was, I was utilizing contract labor that would kind of be 1099s on the team and they would drop the ball and then I'd have major client problems and then I'd get, you know, Hey, I, I need a refund or this or that. And now you know, I've got to balance cash flow and payroll. And it was my first real big lesson in that arena. And I realized at that time during college, I was in my last probably two years. And I was like, I really, I don't want the stress of this during college. I just kind of want to enjoy the passive income that I was generating from YouTube and just enjoy the rest of my college years without the stress of nine employees and having to deal with clients in the whole nine. And so that's where I learned my first big lesson and decided to, yeah, I, I know there's going to be questions there. So. Well, well, so you built that business up to couple hundred thousand. Is that right? Two, two yeah. Million. I was doing a few hundred thousand at, at, at the top side. And then uh, YouTube was obviously providing passive income. Right. And so, so you're earning, you know, six, some six figures from YouTube without really doing anything, but posting videos and you grew your business. There's so many lessons in here. So one of the lessons I just, I heard as I wrote it down was try a lot of things. So I, I feel like when I talk to law firm owners and maybe you can say this too, they feel like they, they, you know, they want to try like one thing and, and that's it. They, they don't keep like, they just want that one thing to work. Right. And, and sometimes yeah. it does. And when you work with experts, oftentimes it does, but more times than not, you have to try multiple iterations. Even when you and I create sales scripts for us or for anybody else, you test, you tried multiple things until you figured out what works. And I think that's a lesson there. Would you agree with that? Yes, but there are two things that led to that. I'm not a perfectionist, so I did not care if things were perfect. And to, hmm. again, call this nature, I had zero fear of failure. So I just didn't care if things failed. I was willing to test things. And if it just failed, I, I didn't care. Like I, I was kind of numb to it. it. Just It made no difference to me whatsoever. It would either work or it wouldn't, but I wouldn't be scared to test it. And so I think those two helped me be able to test a bunch of different things. So, so yeah, th that's huge. The fact that you had no fear of failure and you weren't a perfectionist. Would you say that you find law firm owners have a fear of failure and are perfectionists by nature when you find, when we run into them? Both. Yes. Both. Traditionally, right. so I that, see that they inherit both of those traits. Yes. So it gets in their way a little bit, right? Right. 
Yeah. Okay. Got it. So we can unpack that, but we don't really know because we're not them. So we don't know why it happens. We just know that it's there. So for the law firm owner out there, if you're listening to this, recognize that in yourself and recognize that as in some cases, certainly a strength in some of the things that you do, but yeah. in marketing and business also could be a weakness, right? So Correct. the other thing that you said was, you said, I wanted to get them off YouTube and onto my mm -hmm. list. Why, yeah. What was that all about? And why is that so important? Well, the number one asset in your business is your list. And on YouTube, if YouTube shut down tomorrow, YouTube theoretically owns that audience. I have, I, I don't own it. They're subscribers. I post content to it. Great. They see it when I post it on YouTube. But if that some reason went away, I'm screwed. So I had to figure out a way to get them off of YouTube and on my house list where they were now, I owned that list. And now I could email into them. Now I have a list of people that will buy things, that will respond to things. And so it, it was really a protection tool as well as an asset. And that list is part of what served me so well during that time because you have other brands, you have advertisers. And if they have an opportunity to not just market on YouTube, but also connect with your list who you have built a relationship with, well, that makes a world of difference. Yeah, because you were able to leverage that list. If you wanted, if you had, you were going to go on a trip to London with school or something, you could email into the list and offer some product, service, or whatever. And some portion of your list would just naturally buy it because they had a trust factor with you and they knew you delivered good quality stuff. And so they would give you money and you'd wake up in the morning and boom, you'd have three, four, five, ten thousand dollars, right? I, I, you, I still routinely do that. If I just want to grab a little extra cash and I have a good product that I know, like a course that I've built and I'll just throw a sale into the list just to have some fun money. So wait, how many subscribers did you have on YouTube? It's up to like 95,000 subscribers now. And at, at the peak, it, it was doing three to 5 million views a year and several hundred thousand hours of watch time. And how many people are on your email list? 35, 40,000. Including, that's not including those who unsubscribed through the years. So, so you've, it was bigger right. than that, but people got off of it, right? So yeah. you were able to get some 30 to 40% of your, your subscriber list to move over to your email list that you now own. So you're not just relying on them seeing the YouTube video. You can control, well, you can communicate with them at will. And so do you see that as an opportunity for law firms as well? Do you see that law firms don't necessarily understand the power in their list and what they can do with it? Absolutely. I, I mean, many don't even recognize the idea of building a list, right? You're taking all of your marketing ideas, resources, money, time, investing them into marketing. You might as well capitalize on that and make sure we're harvesting every single person that comes through build a list because now you got a list and even if they don't need your service today, now you've got a list that you can continue to build a relationship and now you're the go-to for them when they do have this problem that your firm helps solve. Yeah. And so, I, so many firms I, see, I hear, well, bankruptcy, they're only going to be served once and I don't need to see them again for another seven years. Why do I matter? Well, because what if you decide at some point in the road that you want to offer personal injury or you want to work with a personal injury firm and market into your list and do a fee share mm -hmm. or something or some other type of firm like an estate planning firm or a family law firm? And yep. maybe you don't do the work, but you could get a fee share out of it. And, you know, so there's all sorts of ways to monetize that list. But at the end of the day, your relationship with that list and the bigger the audience that knows, likes and trust you, the more referrals you can get from them, the, the more trust factor you can build and gain, the more reviews you can get from them. You know, everything that you want from your list is accessible if you'll just build a list and communicate with it. Did I accurately say that? Absolutely. Okay. So then the final lesson was that you, it was interesting as you went into the, you started offering services. And so you were in mm -hmm. the service business of building websites for people. Yeah. What you found is that two things, you found your desire to, to manage the way that you were managing it whilst you were going through school. So the lack of focus that you had, you didn't have enough time to put in it because you had school and you had other yeah. responsibilities, a girlfriend, a fraternity, whatever. And then you had mm -hmm. all these employees you were managing it. You decided it wasn't worth it. So that's one lesson making the decision. And the second lesson is if you're not very good at what you do and you don't have great, a great team with great systems and great structures that execute on a regular basis, you yeah. speed up the pace at which people figure out you're not very good at what you do. And it can be detrimental to your overall business. And so 
those two things led you to decide to close that. And I, I don't know if you see the parallel or what the lesson there is for law firms. Yeah, I, I mean, right. I, I think that the, the parallel is recognizing that between sales and operations, there's a delicate balance and you got to be able to fulfill on what you say you're going to do. And there was a valuable lesson there for me. Of course, you know, we took care of the clients, made sure we made everything whole for any clients that didn't have a great experience. But you've got to be able to make sure that you've got a good client experience on the backside of the sales process. For me, I was very good at selling the projects and we sold a lot of them. But the systems on the back end weren't where they needed to be from an operations standpoint. So to your point, we just sped up the pace at which everybody realized the experience wasn't all that phenomenal on the other side. Mm -hmm. And so for the law firm owners, it's that delicate balance. You need sales. you got to maximize sales, but you need to make sure you've got systems built in on the backside to micromanage that client experience and fulfill on the result that you promised. Yeah, good. I love it. Man, what lessons today? That is Awesome. Buying so, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, we've got, I mean, we have got, man. Okay. Last, last question. So we, you know, we bridged the gap now. They, they've got the full picture of how you started, got through it, what you did now, how you, you know, what you've been doing, working with lawyers now for over 5,000 initial consultations to understand the, what they go through. And obviously you experience the pain that goes around all that. What are some of your personal habits that help you stay disciplined and on task? Yeah, well, First and foremost, obviously taking care of the health, right? So I think the gym helps refocus. There was a period in time there where I got off consistency with it and I recognized it, right? I felt it in the day. I recognized it wasn't as sharp, wasn't as focused, wasn't as energetic. So making sure waking up, getting to the gym every day. But then also I'm a very disciplined person, but I'm probably the most fluid disciplined person that there is. So I'm very disciplined in the things that I need to get done, but I'm very fluid about when they happen. Mm. And so I would just say that making sure if there's stuff you need to get done, for me, that success habit is to make sure it gets blocked, right? I have to block it in the calendar. And if mm. I don't block it in the calendar, not that it won't get done, but it may not get done at the time I need it to get done. And so that's one of the biggest things I could tell, especially law firm owners, you're busy. And usually you're getting to things when you can. And so my biggest tip would be block it in the calendar if you want it to actually happen. So that way you ensure it actually happens. Otherwise, people are going to be chomping at the bit for your time. You're going to get caught with a consult. You're going to be caught with case work. And it's just not going to happen. So that would be the biggest thing that I personally do from a success standpoint to make sure stuff gets done. Well, that was a, those are two wonderful, perfect lessons, making sure you take care of exercise and take care of your health because it's a, it does ripple effect down into your daily activities and time blocking. Well, hey, Michael, thanks so much for being on today. You know, for those of you that are listening, we do have a basic gentleman's agreement. We love doing this. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Hope you enjoy the lessons that you learned from Michael today. Sorry, MPS today. And I hope that it you were able to draw the conclusions as to what this means to you and your law firm. And if you love these recordings, look, we, there's no compensation we need. Our, our compensation is in your love. And the way that you give us your love is by to, to like it and follow it and comment on it and share it and subscribe and wh wherever you are and however you're listening to this podcast, you know what to do by now. We'll keep doing it if you keep letting us know that we're doing a halfway decent job. And so I, again, I hope that you've found value in this today. And Michael, thanks for taking the time and time blocking your time today to record this session. I think there was a lot of writer downers, some nuggets, and people got to get a little bit more insight on who you are. So as you're doing these interviews, they know you've got the chops behind it to stand up and be able to say, I know what it is that needs to get done. So nice work. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Thank you for taking the time to interview. Good questions today and good unpacking. And I think there was, uh, in John Lee Dumas's terms, a lot of value bombs dropped today for law firm owners to take out of this. And uh, appreciate everyone taking the time to listen or watch. And to Rich's point, just make sure to hit that subscribe or follow button, depending on the platform you're listening or watching on. And hey, if you do want to learn more about optimizing the sales process, the link's down in the description below. We'd love to schedule a time to talk to you more about your current sales process and how we may be able to help you out with that. All right, everybody. That's a wrap. That's today's pod. Make it a great one.